We start with the last ditch diplomatic efforts to avoid war in Ukraine, even as President Biden says Putin has already decided to invade. This is where we are. This morning, Vice President Harris met with Ukrainian President Zelensky ahead of his speech at the Munich Security Conference, where he scolded the UN seemingly for doing nothing to defend its own charter. Zelensky appeared in Munich despite warnings from the US that he should not leave his country as the security situation there deteriorates. Now, as for Russia, Vice President Harris issued this stark warning. Let me be clear. I can say with absolute certainty, if Russia further invades Ukraine, the United States, together with our allies and partners, will impose significant and unprecedented economic costs. All right. Meanwhile, President Putin today oversaw military drills of Russia's nuclear launch and delivery systems. Biden yesterday dismissed concerns that Putin would use nukes in a war with Ukraine. The more immediate concern is the Russian troops at Ukraine's border right now. It is now estimated at 190,000. That's according to the U.S. Uh, to the U.S. Moscow has denied any plans to invade. Now, Russia-backed separatists are evacuating civilians from the territories they control in eastern Ukraine as ceasefire violations continue along the front lines. Joining me now from Kiev is Terrell J. Starr. He's the host of Black Diplomats podcast and senior non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Also with us, Erin Haynes. She's the editor at large for the 19th. And here with me on set, NBC News chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander. And that's who I'll begin with right now. Peter, we just heard that very interesting uh, address by President Zelensky where he was begging. It was desperate. And he said, this is not a donation. We should be begging for? Where do things stand? And is it a good idea that he's there and has left Ukraine, considering he may not have safe pa passage back in? Tiffany, I think you're exactly right. This really did feel like a man whose back is to the wall. Right now, we're hearing from a president speaking before the world who clearly made the assessment that there was value in leaving his country despite those warnings of what could happen in his absence. Concerns among American officials we're speaking, to, we're speaking to right now that Vladimir Putin may try to exploit his absence, that there could be some form of an assault that would begin while he was away, but he obviously felt like it was necessary to address those individuals, those world leaders, Nancy Pelosi, the vice president, among others in person. The vice president, Zelensky, met this morning for about 40 minutes minutes today where he said in the in the brief remarks where reporters our colleagues at the White House are allowed in the room he said that they were effectively asking for specific steps to take place that they wanted more defensive aid even in these waning moments before it appears that an attack is going to happen right now and what he said is that the Ukrainian army is basically the first line of defense for all of Europe as he said in those remarks moments ago after us who is next you ask a good question though about his departing there Think about this. It's only about two and a half hours between Kiev right. and between Munich there. But Lufthansa just announced that they're going to be canceling flights beginning next week into Ukraine right now. So we have heard from his uh, his officials, officials in the Ukrainian Zelensky government, that he'll be traveling back later today. But that is, although they don't fly over Russia or over Belarus, which has Russian backed forces there, that is a, a dangerous trip home. Absolutely, because we talked a little bit. I mean, it doesn't take a lot for somebody to identify this plane in the sky and potentially take it out. We have no reason to believe that will happen right now, but that is a, a possibility as he left. Uh, Terrell, I'll turn to you because you're there on ground. You know, I wonder what, what's next? I mean, this uh, seems to be a matter of waiting to see who blinks first. Tell us what the mood is there. Well, first of all, I say welcome from Kiev. And right now, the mood amongst the people there is definitely a lot of anxiety. People don't know what's going to happen. Kiev, just a few hours north of the uh, of the city, uh, you have uh, you have amassed a, a number of Russian troops at the border. So the troops can come down here in a matter of hours. Uh, fighting can take a matter of days. But it, with that anxiety, people are pretty calm and chill. If you see right here, this lake uh, in the back of me uh, is frozen. People are walking across it, and so people are going about their lives. They know that there's a possibility of war, but. This has been an eight-year drama for them that's, that has a number of up and downs. And so people are just waiting for the thing to happen. And I'll close out by saying that this is what Zelensky was saying is that we are the most military-ready, the most combat-ready army in all of Europe. And we are the guardians of Europe. And so if this can happen to us, it can happen to you. And so you're living in a world in which you think that this will not reach your borders. And the reason why it has is because Ukraine 
is a buffer between Putin and the rest of Europe. And why are you forsaking us to uh, President Vladimir Putin? That's basically what he said in a nutshell. Uh, indeed, he did. And Aaron, you know, I have to say, I was struck uh, by seeing Vice President Harris on the global stage uh, sending that very stark warning to Russia. And I'm curious what you think, uh, what that does for her uh, legacy here at home. We're in a midterm year. She is the heir apparent on the Democratic ticket. Uh, to see her in this capacity uh, certainly will have domestic impacts here politically. What's your take? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Good morning, Tiffany. It's good to be with you and to discuss this increasingly tense situation and also to see you, Brother Terrell. I hope you're staying safe over there in Ukraine. So, look, uh, the vice president has been on the world stage a few times in her first year or so as vice president. And what administration officials point out to me is that she has been pretty well received. I mean, whether she's been smoothing over relations in France after that submarine deal or being on hand for the inauguration recently of the first woman president of Honduras. Uh, just as you pointed out, she's somebody who could be her party's nominee for president down the road. So these kinds of world stage moments kind of bolster her foreign policy bona fides, and that's going to be important in terms of normalizing her leadership both at home and abroad. Uh, this Munich Security Conference specifically is something that uh, President Biden also attended when he was vice president, and her being there is another sign of the trust and confidence and partnership that he has with, with Vice President Harris, and you saw, you know, her being seen as, as respected and, applaud, and applauded on that stage when she said very forcefully, uh, you know, that she, without absolute certainty if Russia further invades Ukraine, the United States, together with our allies and partners, will impose significant and unprecedented economic costs. Now, when you hear that kind of talk, that reminds me of, of, of what you saw from her as a senator, grilling nominees during the Trump administration, and something that she's been doing for much of her life as a prosecutor. And that, you know, seeing how she takes on bad guys or adversaries is really part of the lived experience that she also brings to the role of vice president. And she's also in Munich really reinforcing the president's strong message of support uh, and standing with America's allies. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we have to consider what's happening here domestically. I know when this was first happening, I wondered if Putin felt like, well, you know, America's divided. I have helped sow that divide in America. Uh, now might be the time to adopt this knuck if you buck attitude, if you will, quite frankly. I'm curious how it will play out politically here in terms of the divide between the political parties. I want you guys to take a listen to Tucker Carlson's take on the uh, situation in Ukraine and Russia. Why do I why care, care about what's going on in the conflict between Ukraine and Russia? Be because, and I'm serious. Be like, why do I'll I tell care? You why. And why shouldn't I root for Russia, be which I am? Okay, so I have to say, at the end of that broadcast, after his audience reacted a certain way, Tucker came back and said, oh, wait, 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 I was just joking. It didn't appear that he was joking there, but he did say at the end of that broadcast that he was. However, not long ago, uh, just a few weeks ago, he said this. Disloyal to side with Russia but loyal to side with Ukraine. They're both foreign countries that don't care anything about the United States. Kind of strange. Peter, I know you cover the White House. However, I think the implications here um, of what happens here domestically will be challenging, considering that you have this kind of talk from right-wing extremists and right-wing outlets like Fox News. Where do you anticipate Republicans will fall on this issue, and how will President Biden navigate that while potentially getting involved in a war? I think people can make their own assessment of what Tucker Carlson just said right there. But as you watch the way this is playing out at home, one thing that's important today is there is a bipartisan group who joined the vice president in traveling overseas right now for this Munich security conference to try to come together. And the Republican Party, uh, they are in many ways, we've heard from Mitch McConnell, though he's not the Trump wing of the party, they have supported the way that, that this has been handled mostly by the Biden administration. They have desired that there had been sanctions that took place in advance as a way to sort of steer him away from any attack as opposed to responding to one that might come in the days ahead at this point. But the bottom line is the takeaway for Vladimir Putin, the desire was to split up NATO, to sort of expose the weaknesses that existed among those NATO leaders and those NATO countries right now, weaknesses or those differences that became more clear during the Trump administration. But instead, what's happened is that those countries have come close together, at least the Biden administration views it as such right now. Can they hold together, though, in these days? Does Germany peel off, as might be the assessment of Vladimir Putin? That's, I think, the way that people will watch out the way the next several days play out. Yeah, and I, you know, I think here um, uh, Americans are not necessarily uh, solely focused on what happens in foreign policy. Oftentimes, when these discussions happen, people want to know, but how does it impact me? Right. Um, so, Terrell, I'll kick it back to you. Um, if war uh, does 
breakout in, in, in Ukraine. How do you anticipate that it will impact domestic politics? You have a very unique position, having uh, being over in, in Kiev, and, but being a resident of the United States. What's your assessment of this? Gas prices. Uh, one of the things that people don't recognize is that Russia is the second largest exporter of natural gas in the world. And while Russia does not export much gas for the United States at all, in fact, very little, roughly 3% of our exports come from Russia, the issue is that it's a globally traded commodity, which means that if any disruption of the uh, process of, of, of this uh, infrastructure in this region is affected, then that's going to hike up gas prices. And so, first of all, you're going to see it at the pump. Uh, and then finally, when you think about the geopolitical dynamics of this, there's going to be a reassessment or realignment of, of, of troop uh, movement. Now, because Ukraine is not a part of NATO, troops will not reach Ukrainian soil, but there will be a conversation about America's role in regards to buffering the EU member states and NATO states from Russia. And so there are going to be much larger implications than people really anticipate. So, uh, so, so in regards to the peace, in regards to the peace progress, peace progress that Putin really has no interest in, there's going to be major military implications. But starting off, it definitely you're going to feel it at the gas pump, 100 percent. Yeah, absolutely. And they have a lot of capabilities, uh, Russia does. And Aaron, you, of course, know this. In 2016, Russia was laser focused on black voters in this country, uh, sowing discord, uh, attacking some of our social media outlets. I will say that Russia did attack the DNC and the RNC. Um, so this will certainly be an interesting, uh, uh, as it develops, we'll see, see how it plays out. We're out of time, Aaron, but I do want to just ask you very quickly about Zelensky. You know, this is a comedian who turned president. He has put some of his former uh, castmates in very powerful positions of power. I don't want to be pot kettle here. We survived four years of Donald Trump, but I do wonder about his uh, competency on the world stage facing something like this. Your thoughts? Listen, I think seeing seeing the speech that he just delivered, I mean, that, he understands this is no laughing matter. He, he certainly is not uh, making any jokes or making light of the situation in Ukraine as we sit here uh, this morning. Uh, the seriousness of this is not lost on him, which I think uh, is maybe an important distinction between himself and, and our former president, the way that he is approaching this, the way that he is saying, you know, Ukraine, we are the little guy. This is not just a Ukraine problem. We need help. We need our allies. We need uh, the rest of the world to care about the situation that is happening here and to get involved because it could be us today, but, it, you know, who knows who it could be tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. I take your point there. Thank you so much, Terrell Starr. Please be safe over there in Kiev. Aaron Haynes, and my sincere thanks to my colleague Peter Alexander for sticking around uh, and helping us talk through all of this.